Hi, this is Ted Price at Insomniac Games. And today's episode of Game Maker's Notebook is special because we're in the middle of a worldwide pandemic. Despite that, we are doing a remote podcast, and I have the distinct pleasure of talking to Robin Walker, who is a longtime programmer and designer and instrumental with a very talented team at Valve in the creation of Half-Life Alex. If you haven't played it, you absolutely should. It is a testament to the power of VR, and in my opinion, demonstrated why VR is uniquely suited to games. Robin and I cover a wide variety of topics. We spent a lot of time on the construction of Alex and what Valve's approach was in taking a beloved franchise like Half-Life and bringing it into today with a unique twist. Robin also talks about Valve's culture and the importance of audio and why it's so important to have the audio team involved from the very beginning of any project. Welcome to the Game Makers Notebook, a podcast featuring a series of in-depth one-on-one conversations between game makers providing a thoughtful, intimate perspective on the business and craft of interactive entertainment. The Game Makers Notebook is presented by the Academy of Interactive Arts and Sciences, a member-driven organization dedicated to the recognition and advancement of interactive entertainment. Robin. Welcome. It's great to have you here. Thanks for the invite. Uh, and I, what's fascinating about this show right now is that we are at the height of the coronavirus pandemic. So Robin and I are in different cities. Robin is up in Seattle and I'm in Los Angeles. And that won't stop us from having a what I hope is a wide ranging conversation about uh, your career, Robin, and the things that uh, go on at Valve. Sounds good. So, you know, first, just because it's topical, how has Valve been coping with the pandemic? Uh, I mean, obviously, we're all working from home uh, and we've we've encouraged people to be sort of set up to work from home whenever they want to uh, for years now. We have tried to be flexible. So there are people who work in all kinds of different ways around their families and and, uh, you know, work versus home and stuff like that. So it was more a matter of you know, when we saw it coming, letting everyone know, hey, make sure you're set up to work from home. And if you need a PC or anything like that, or, you know, let ITG know so they can get on that uh, and help you out. And uh, that's that's really cool. So you guys already had a work from home program in place. I mean, yeah, we've always going way back to when, you know, even time of Half-Life 1, we had people there who I remember there was a fellow, um, Dave Rilla, who still works at Valve today who, um, you know, in those days at Half-Life 1 would work uh, off hours, so he got to spend more time with his uh, family. And so he'd start later and, and end later and stuff like that. And so we've always tried to be flexible to how people want to work, and working from home or at work is sort of an obvious extension of that. Uh, and, you know, I mean, today so much of what we do is in the cloud and all that sort of jazz, and so um, it's not a huge deal. Uh, th- Obviously, there's parts of the project like, um, you know, on the on the Alex team, we we sort of it, the the week we started working from home, we realized if if we had had to start working from home like one week, maybe two weeks earlier, it would have been, had a really scary effect on our ship date because mm-hmm. we just happened to coincide our content lockdown. Uh, you know, when we said, "All right, we're done making anything now. Let's just fix what we have in ship." Uh, that really i think if i remember rightly it was about a week or two before stay at home orders came uh actually i guess the stay at home orders actually came a little later it was a week or two before at valve people started to say you know I, i'm not comfortable coming into work um since you know there were a fair few people at the office who started doing that before the actual stay at home orders came about and so yeah it, we, we it ended up being you know, a good time for Alex as much as it's ever a good time, I guess. Uh, <laughs> in that, you know, we were already had gone from a team of roughly eighty people or so down to really only, you know, twenty or so people doing work. Uh, right. You know, finishing everything. Is there anything new that you all discovered from this particular experience of having everybody out of the office? I suspect that we are woefully behind everyone else. I bet every random indie studio out there with 10 people who spread across the globe are far more 
skilled and experienced at working remotely uh, than we are. Um, you know, I, I don't think we have any, you know, we, we only really learned how do we finish a project right now when we're all remote and that's a surreal and separate enough process, you know, compared to normal game development. I think the last, you know, two or three weeks of anything are always sort of an exception to any rule around in terms of process around shipping yeah, something. True. And uh, so I think we sort of learned how to do that when we're, we have to do it all through text chats and, you know, Mattermost and that sort of stuff. But in terms of how we actually design things in this, in this sort of method, I think there are, you know, many, many other people out there with a lot more experience than us. I think the only, I, I suspect it'll be particularly challenging for us just because of the way we like to work. Uh, you know, we huge fans of big collaborative groups attacking things um, and there's no real especially on, from a game design sense no person who who owns it and so uh, you know i'm not quite sure how we'll manage to structure that well uh, do you think that uh video conferences zoom calls teams calls those things can partially take the place of those in-person meetings i mean we're definitely doing that um it's you know we've We've learned over the years that we, we sort of use co-location as a dumb solution to all kinds of process problems. Um, you know, if you and I are going to work on something together for just a couple of weeks, um, you know, maybe a programmer and a level designer or some combination like that, there's just no reason not to go and sit next to each other. And we do that all the time uh, because, you know, we find there's so much, um, so much creativity comes out of, of just casual conversation uh, and often conversate, you know, there might be two or three people working in tight coordination on something, but they're in a room with three or four other groups of twos and threes and that you get a lot of great cross creative sort of cross pollination between those little creative groups because they overhear each other and they chat and it's easy to turn around and just call across the room and like, Hey, we were thinking of doing this. What, what do you think? Um, and so I don't, know how we'll replicate that kind of stuff in a, you know, in a sort of video conference like environment. Um, you know, when we did our, <laughs> the closest thing I can think of that we've actually done was, uh, um, you know, of course we'd had a, a, a shipping party planned for shipping Alex. Cause you know, with everything just being online these days for years now, we've had sort of a shipping party at the office where we'll have a big red button, it's connected to a machine that spits out smoke and plays flashes lights and plays alarm sounds and everything. It's all just, you know, we just have to press a button for years. When it used to be that you, when you press the button, it just clicked a mouse on a computer somewhere, which had a, a mouse hovering over the steam, um, uh, the button that actually just set it live on steam. And, uh, so we were gearing up to do that same thing this time around and realized we would be able to do that. And so we, tried to get as many, we just sort of said, oh, well, let's just see how many people we can get into a single big video conference and ended up getting, I'm not quite sure how many, probably over 80 or so people showed up and were all there when we symbolically clicked the button. So, Okay. <laughs> well, it's close enough to the real thing, right? Make it up as you go. Yeah. Well, do you think that the industry is going to change at all as a result of what we're going through right now? Uh, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, we've definitely had, I think, I assume lots of people are having similar thoughts and conversations to what's been happening, uh, you know, that I've seen happening around Valve, where there's definitely some people are realizing that, um, you know, with a bit of uh, process adjustment, I think they could be fairly productive uh, from home and perhaps thinking about how they may restructure their, how, the, you know, where they are when they, when they do their work. Um, but, you know, I really don't know. I mean, I don't know how this is going to go. You know, there's a group of us, you know, there's a bunch of people at Valve who, on, on Alex, who have finished up their, their time on Alex and are starting to th think about what they work on next. And, um, you know, one of the nice things about Valve is there's always this set of options in front of you from things that are live services that are, have been running for years to things that are, you know, coming up and new that we haven't announced. And um, it's sort of, 
weird to think about how to, to work on some of those newer things um, when you can't sort of – we don't have as experience to process. Um, and there's a lot more things up in the air and, you know, far fewer constraints, right? So it's always a lot scarier. Um, well, let's, let's assume that – you actually do go back and life resumes to, uh, in a way that's similar to what, what we've experienced prior to the pandemic. How does Valve decide on its next projects? Uh, <laughs> how Valve decides on projects is a long running sort of source of, of confusion to people at Valve and people outside Valve, I'm sure. Um, you know, that, the sort of super short answer is those decisions are made largely the same way any other decision at Valve is made, but it's sort of, the, it's all, it's very messy um, and the, there's sort of a lot of detail to it. And But messiness to us um, doesn't imply, like there are some processes where we're sort of happy with them being messy because the messiness is a, is a less, you know, is a lesser evil than other things that we would get if we tried to make it less messy. So I guess mm -hmm. to, to be more, uh, to put some specifics around that, like, um, you know, like what's happening right now with Alex. So you've got a project with a bunch of people and they finish up uh, their project. And thankfully it's not another service project that's going to run for the next billion years. And so we'd, people actually get to move on. And so they, you know, that there's a simple choice about, well, where do those people go? And so if you wanted to eliminate messiness, you could make that very easy, right? You could pick a person. Um, it could be Gabe, it could be, doesn't really matter, and say, all right, that person decides where everyone goes. That's a very crisp, clear process. It'll be over in a couple of days maybe, and everyone will know what they're going to do. Uh, but obviously there's trade-offs there about those people's ability to feel like they have control over their, um, their, their the work they work they're doing, the, the, their growth in the future, the people they get to work with. Uh, those are all choices that you've now removed from them. Now, you could um, let them all decide individually, which is what we try to do. But, of course, it means that something that might have been resolved in a couple of days now may take weeks, maybe even a month to shake out before everyone has figured out where they're going. And in that time, they're going to need to talk to a bunch of other people in the, in the company about their projects, um, you know, like if I came to work on, on CSGO, what sort of work, you know, how could I help? What kind of things are you trying to do? What's, what's the CSGO team's plan for the next six months or so? Uh, how could I fit in? How could I help? Those are the sort of conversations that I would need to have with essentially all the different groups in the, in the company if I want to, um, you know, have a, a make, make a choice about where I want to work. And so there are processes like that that we, we sort of accept that they're messy. They're going to take time to shake out. Um, but we prefer to optimize for the things we get out of those, which are things like uh, employees feel like they have a lot of control over what it is they work on and why they're working on it and who they get to work with. Um, in fact, we try to encourage employees as much as possible to think about basically who you want to work with, and perhaps more than exactly what you want to work on, because historically speaking, we found that tends to lead to your happiness more than, than the specific thing that, you know, you can have a lot of fun and learn a lot if you work with the right people, it doesn't, what you actually work on tends to not matter as much as you might think. So are you implying that not everybody gets along at Valve? I'm, I'm joking. I'm joking. <laughs> we're we're human beings. So, uh, <laughs> so, I mean, this is a super long way to circle back around to your, your original question, which is, I mean, the choice of do you start something up new is a thing that you sort of, and any one of those people could be thinking about in addition to their question that they're asking themselves of, do I go work on Counter-Strike or do I go work on uh, Dota or do I go work on Steam or, or do I go work on hardware or something, right? And so another one of those choices is you have is do I try and spin something up that's new? And spinning something up that's new is a messy, complex process that takes quite a while as well. And, um, you know, I think for Alex, for example, it took probably... Two, two, maybe three months, really. Um, I think from the moment that, a, you know, sort of group of five or six people started, started thinking themselves, you know, started really doing some work to the point where I think other people started regarding it as a thing that might be worth going to work on. Um, and the, that first month is probably more time spent talking to people than it is actually building anything. 
Um, because, you know, at the end of the day, if you're going to try and get a bunch of people to come work on a project, uh, you have to be realistic and say, you know, if I ask, say, 50, 60 people to spend the next three or four years of their careers on this project, um, you know, to be honest and responsible, I have to really do a huge amount of work to be confident that that is a good choice for them and myself, obviously, relative to working on Counter-Strike or working on Dota or working on Steam, which are the real, very valuable options, right? There is a vast number of people out there who would really like everyone at Valve to work on any one of those things. Uh, and so I, I have, a, I think, a responsibility as a person thinking about starting something up that's new to really force myself to say, is that as valuable as working on a big Counter-Strike feature or a big Steam feature? Um, you know, it can't be a small side fun project for me that I would like to do. It needs to be something that's meaty and valuable to a real large number of people out there. And so well, you know, it takes I gotta a long say, time. Well, two months doesn't sound like a long time to me, frankly. If you're talking about a brand new project the size of Alex, uh, that that's, seems like no time at all to have an idea and to curate it to the point where you can have other people buying in to its potential. Yeah, I, I completely agree. I, I think that Alex, to some extent, one of the reasons that the project you know, succeeded uh, or was a project that we could really get going fast was because it cheated so much around those things. Um, hmm. You know, it, 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 it leveraged so much of, of what, uh, of the strengths we already had, right? Like it was, it was taking a gameplay we understood really well and figuring out how to, how to put it into a, you know, transition it into a new medium with new, new sort of capabilities. That's a heck of a lot less scary than starting with that blank slate and saying, all right, what is, you know, what's the next half-life? Um, which is, and so, yeah, I, I, you are correct. Sorry. Two months felt, it felt like forever at the time, <laughs> um, but yeah, in retrospect, yes, it's definitely, um, you know, not forever. I mean, Alex took a fair while to grow to that 80 person team. Um, I think it was really year two or three, maybe was where we really it might've been the end of year two ish somewhere around there. We really start getting into that more, that larger number. Um, because well, I, you know, it's, it's, sorry. it seems to me that you, I mean, it was a very smart move to, to build on Half-Life the way you did with Alex. I, I mean, I, I, I just will fanboy for a second and say that it's stunning. I, the, the attention to detail that you all put into the game is extraordinary. And I, I feel like because we at Insomniac have similar challenges in that there are franchises that we continue to, to build on and we walk this tightrope between doing something that feels new, but also delivering enough of the the core of the franchise to keep people feeling like they're in familiar territory. And I feel like you, you really struck that balance well with Alex as a, as a player. Uh, so I, to me, I'm sorry, I'm again, I'm, I said I'd fanboy and I'm going to continue for just a second. Uh, it really took me back to what I loved about Half-Life 2 and made the world even more alive than I remembered. And, and you were constantly telling these amazing visual stories with key elements from the series. So, so I, I want to sort of dive in with that long preamble, want to dive into Alex a little bit and, and ask what, what for you in particular, what was different about designing Alex versus designing Half-Life 2? Um, it's a good question. And I, I don't want to sort of act like I'm avoiding it, but um, I, I feel, to me, like design is sort of abstractly all the same. Um, and and it, creating, maybe. I think design yeah. is, is an unfair term. It's like building the game, sort of. Yeah, um, I mean, you know, when I think about the way we build Half-Life, I, I think at this point we have a fairly understood method for how we build, build Half-Life. And it was a thing we sort of had to figure out in Half-Life 1, um, really in the last year of Half-Life 1. Uh, where we sort of almost started, didn't quite start from scratch, but we took all everything we had and crunched it down into a, this ball, tight ball of, the, all right, this is the good bit of everything we've built over the years prior, and now let's just replicate it as much as we can. Like the, what we took from that, I think, or what we learned there was a process for how you build a Half-Life game and, and then sort of we're able to do that in Half-Life 2. 
And so when it came to Alex, it was sort of the same application of the same process, but just, uh, and the process is sort of, you know, to ultra simplify it is collaboratively design a five, 10 minute piece of content, build it, put it in front of a bunch of play testers, iterate on it, then move on to the next 10 minutes of the game and just keep doing that until you've built the whole thing. Um, wow. I mean, it's sort of, I'm, I'm oversimplifying it. Uh, because well, actually, I want to ask about that specifically. So how, you know, this is a challenge that we at Insomniac face all the time. How far, how much polish did you put into those chunks uh, before moving on to the next one? Um, yeah, that's a really good question. Uh, I mean, so we tried to do, we tried to do it faster in this, in Alex, but didn't end up, but we took longer. So I think in both Half-Life 2 and Alex, we ended up doing essentially three passes over the whole product. And so we build everything. We build that on that first pass, you build it to the point where, you know, you know, it's going to work. Right? You know, you can polish it more and it will be, it will be better, but you know what you've got is shippable. Um, mm-hmm. And so you can keep moving forward. And at this point in that first pass, you're still building larger systems as well. Uh, and so you're trying to build elements that you know are going to be useful beyond just the room you're building, right? So, you know, in the case of Alex, it's, you know, this is where you build something like the tone of puzzles where you, you know, mm-hmm. you're tracing walls and you're building the base AIs, enemies, um, you're building weapons, uh, you know, we're messing with systems like how much, trying to figure out how much can we get players to explore the world, um, what's the sort of level of detail we need and all that sort of, so you're trying to answer these big systemic questions and you may be answering them in parts of the product, right? Like Tona might exist in only a small part, few parts of the product, but you're hopeful that it'll be bigger and more useful if it works out. Uh, And so that's all that first, and everything's getting pushed to the point where it's, none of it's really shippable, but it's all, all all gets to the point where you you know that all right finishing it it just needs to be finished it's, it'll be good enough at this mm-hmm. point i like to think of it as you're actually getting further and further from shipping throughout this whole point right like you're not getting closer to shipping it, there's a super deceptive feeling where you're getting oh man we're building like look how much more stuff we've got it's all so much better than what we had last month and we've got more than we had last month and what you don't you know you have to realize it's like yeah and you're getting further from shipping because all these cool things have to get finished and none of them are. Yeah, and then yeah, the, that's a conundrum. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's it's really deceptive. It feels like you're getting so far, but you're actually pushing your your ship date further out. Um, and then in that second pass, you start you know where we we start to really you take pieces that have been working like all right this you know because this is all being done by various different groups right We're running in parallel, and so you start to maybe cut something or or moves uh, that wasn't working out and replace it with something that start, so some other group had built in some other place or you take some bit that works out well and you start to smear it across other parts of the product so uh, you start paying attention to pacing more uh so and you know and solve pacing problems with solutions from other parts of the product right oh you know there's too much combat here and players are exhausted we need something in between what's what's the What's a, what's a systemic element like toner or something that has been built and used somewhere else in the product that we can put here and things like that. Um, we did larger scale things. I think, you know, we took the shotgun that was originally appearing about halfway through the game and moved it up significantly closer to the start of the game, stuff like that. So there are bigger structural changes at this point. Um, and then there, I think at this point, we did some polishing on areas and we thought they were good enough to ship at that point. Um, you know, I think in particular we did art passes on some of the earlier parts of the game and we thought these were good enough to ship at this point. Um, uh, but we did each sort of one of these big passes, we we throw the product out. So while we're building this, there's a continuous stream of playtesters coming in every week. Uh, and so some of the, in the early days, there are people inside the company just on other projects uh, and then they start to be friends and family and all that sort of stuff start going to external people, non-game developers. Um, and But in, uh, in addition to that, when we finish these bigger passes, we'd throw it out to the whole company and say, you know, go play, give us, send us big thoughts and, and we get back larger stra- structural stuff like big pacing problems or um, issues around the sort of stuff you're talking about, like the degree to, of novelty to 
to um, sort of nostalgia, which is the thing we grappled with a lot. Um, or, or just so, big- so company play tests, that's a, that's a fun one. Did, are they mandatory for you all once you get to a certain point in a game like Alex? Uh, no, or they're not they voluntary. voluntary? Um, my first thought when you asked was like, do you mean it's mandatory for everyone else in the company to play the game? Not just, and I was like, that sounds great. Um, <laughs> yeah, you no, know, actually, uh, we, we argue about this all the time internally is uh, because to get people to, to put down what they're working on for other projects and give you honest, blunt feedback takes time, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So we did them over Christmas both times, which was one sort of way to argue that you're probably not getting a huge amount of work done. We put it on... They get, it gets pushed out to to Steam on public, so mm. you know, so that anyone can play out there from their home. And we, uh, on that second one, it was when we index had shipped, and so we handed an index to everyone um, in the company and said, "All right, you know, here's a thing for you to play it on." And so we really hoped, you know, we'd get a bunch of play testing. In the end, you know, like I. I don't think we probably got 30% of the company at the time to play through. I, you know, there's always this, people are super busy, as I'm sure you know, and, and there's always that feeling like if you're not on the project, I think there's this real hope. The longer you can push it off, you know that your first experience is going to be good. Whereas, hmm. you know, the closer it is to shipping, the better the game's going to be, I think. Right. People and people are, I'm, well, let me ask, are, do you find that people are reluctant to show off their stuff? Uh, in early phases and they just ask, Hey Robin, can I, can we just wait for a couple more weeks before we, we show off this, uh, this puzzle or this, this part of the game um, or not, or do not, are people really willing to go out there and show stuff in its raw form? I think that there's people are generally willing to do it. They're always sort of hoping to get it as good as they can, uh, beforehand, but we, it wasn't, it wasn't ever really hard to convince. It was sort of more the opposite, actually. There was always an eagerness on the team's part to, um, you know, to find out what do people, what, what does people in the, in the company think. I think for the first year or so, you know, certainly if um, there, you know, we're quite a small team, and there was this sort of there were people on the team who had worked on previous pieces of stuff that were sort of Half Life related, who were very concerned, you know, like how we. You know, are people in the company going to be unhappy enough that, that they'll try and argue we shouldn't continue? And I think at that point, we um, that wasn't a concern that I or others, most people on the team had because we'd, we'd done so much showing and talking to people throughout the company or, or in our early versions that they sort of all understood what we were trying to do. Yeah. Well, with that in mind, I mean, because you, you kind of infer that there there's an inflection point, right, where people ask, hey, should we continue? Is this going to be a success? Was VR ever part of that conversation such as, hey, maybe we should maybe we should consider doing this not in VR, but on PC? Or was that always just a, a given? This has to be VR. It was always a given just because that was actually how the project started. It didn't ever start as a Half-Life game. It started as a VR game. Uh, and, you know, quickly became a Half-Life game when it became apparent that, you know, in all the various ways that I think people can see now, um, having played it, that it Half-Life just works so well in VR. Um, yeah. And so it, 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 there was, a you know, for I think the entire length of the project, there were always people lamenting, man, I wish, like, I wish there were a lot more people who had VR headsets out there, and I wish we had some way we could make this for non-VR. Um, but every time we ever looked at, you know, what what's left if you take the VR parts out of it, like there's just nothing left. Like it's like all the, I mean, which shouldn't be surprising. We, I mean, all of our effort was spent on trying to um, use VR in, in all the ways we possibly could to make Half Life play, you know, as uh, as Half Lifey as it possibly could. And so, <laughs> um, you know, like it, it, there was, I think, even up. To the point where we shipped, there were still people on the team who were concerned, and they may still be concerned to, to this day. I don't know. Um, with like, well, you know, people are going to take VR out of it, and and I I always felt like um, that if all that would do was show that we were either correct in that we built a lot of stuff that really needed VR and was and was interesting to people, and that they were glad we did it uh, because when it's gone, it's much worse. Or I get to find out that I'm wrong. Actually, that um, that a bunch of what we did we did worked well in VR, 
it sorry, worked well in non-VR and could have been done. And, and so that sounds great too. I'd love to learn that if I'm wrong. Uh, huh. there, that that would sense. be super useful. Um, so speaking of wanting to have more headsets out there, what do you think of the VR market? Is there an inflection point where we're going to see it more widely adopted? I, I, I haven't. I've been so heads down on actually just building Alex that I haven't paid any near as much attention to what's going on in the VR market at large as other people at Valve has have. Um, so I don't feel super comfortable making predictions there. But I but do. Let me let me point out though. I I do think what is awesome about what you and Valve did is you've made the your game playable on all headsets. Right. That's yeah. that really is unique, and I personally feel like that's the kind of thing that does need to happen more frequently for the VR market to continue to expand. Yeah. I, I mean, I think we've probably sound like a broken record uh, at Valve every time we talk about this sort of stuff, but you know, we're just enormous believers in open systems and we're huge believers that they, they always, I was going to say win in the end, but what I, what I mean by that is they produce the most in interesting stuff in the end, right? Like we're a company full of people who came from, the mod communities and and indie company indie devs and all that sort of stuff and we've just seen when you you know game design is too much of a search problem um much less uh, much more of a search problem than an analysis problem and so you get or i should say i guess novel game design and so uh, is a search problem and so you just get that when you you have the, the most people all thinking about it with their own perspectives and their own backgrounds and their own skills. You just get so much more creativity out there. And so we're, we're huge believers that in the end, all the interesting stuff will happen as long as we can make sure that everyone out there can have, have the opportunity to do creative work in the space. And so, yeah, it, like that choice of like, is it playable on everything was, it was just literally never a, th a point of discussion. It was just obvious from the get go that that was going to be the case. Uh, and so we, we worked on that as much as we could. Um, I said I don't feel super comfortable making predictions about the VR market, but I do, like the way I approached it was that, you know, in terms of when I look at, is there a future for VR or anything like that, which is something I think I was asking myself as a game designer, just like many other people out there in the games industry are. And to me, I felt like I've never believed, I think really at Valve we've ever believed it's not going to do silly things like replace stuff, right? We're, we're, we're not all going to stop using our computers to go to VR and stuff like that. But the interesting question was, was whether it would be able to provide experiences that were novel enough that they existed on the, you know, on, in their own space such that everyone who has a computer still wants to get a VR headset as well because there are experiences over there they really want. And so Alex really was about us going after that uh, question, right? We really wanted to find out ourselves. And, you know, there are definitely a ton of other indie devs out there doing super interesting stuff and having, I think, achieved their own answers to that question already. Um, you know, I think we wanted to take a shot at it ourselves because we had, you know, we, we just find we learn more if we go and do it ourselves and if we just look at other things. And so there was this sort of feeling that we needed to go and explore that space um, and in particular, the space I was really interested in exploring, I think, and a bunch of other people on the on the Alex team were was uh, was specifically all around input. Like I, when I when I look at VR, I think everyone uh, often the focus is on the HMD, but as a designer, I find that the controllers are much more interesting than the HMD. Uh, the HMD absolutely adds a lot to it. You, you get you know everyone's conversation. I'm sure everyone who hasn't got aboard VR is sick of everyone in VR talking about immersion and all that sort of stuff. <laughs> but it's clear that there's a very real thing there. You feel like you're in a space much more in VR than in non-VR. But setting that aside, the the bit that seemed most um, fertile in terms of will we be able to build an experience that is truly novel and unlike something people can get in non-VR, it, it really looked to me like the input was where it was going to uh, come from and the track controllers were really uh, the thing that was super exciting. And uh, like, if you've um, 
you guys yeah. nailed it. I will say, I mean, just, just the ability to, to pick up everything in the game and manipulate it the way that you allow players to do with a con is, is, is I think a step beyond what I've seen in most VR games to this point. Right. It was, yeah. And so I can, I mean, obviously it's great that you said that because I, I see your words in action in the game. Thanks. Um, yeah. The, I mean, the, the thing that really I think is super cool about track control is that um, excites me as a designer is that we are getting sort of the best of both worlds as designers. We get the most complex sort of interact the input that we've really gotten from players ever. Like they can provide very subtle and complex input to us uh, in, you know, in an extremely wide range of ways. Yeah, at the same time, it's incredibly obvious and simple to them, um, hmm. which is super cool. Like, you know, my mother plays a lot of, um, uh, you know, sort of mist-like stuff and adventure games, and she can play Alex in a way that she would never be able to play Half-Life 2. I didn't even really ever bother trying to get her to play Half-Life 2 because I know at the point where she sits needs to sit down and move, you, you know, use WASD and a mouse – she's going to spend a bunch of time grappling with that uh, before she really gets to even experience the game. And yet in, in VR, she can actually just stand and I don't even need to explain stuff to her. She can, she'll reach out and pick stuff up. It, even it was interesting to watch because we, we transitioned from, um, from Vive and Vive controllers to Index and Index controllers midway, you know, not quite midway, but early in this project. And it, just the simple switch from using the trigger on the Vive controller to just open and closing your hands uh, with the index controller is a significant one uh, that we observed in play tests. You know, you would, you would get a, a not insignificant number of players who are not, you know, uh, hardcore video game players or anything who would need to get told that they'd have to pull a trigger to pick up, um, pick up an object when the, the, you know, they'd move the hand onto it or something, but you had to tell them to pull the trigger, which, you know, it's, Given that there's not really anything else you could do, I think most gamers would say, well, why wouldn't they just pull the trigger? And it's just it's still not intuitive to a non-gamer, I think, in any way to that there is this sort of very abstracted um, input that you do to, um, you know, like pulling a trigger that means to the game, grab an object or something. But when you put index controllers in, they don't, you don't have to say anything. They just reach out and they try and open and close their hands because the game is generally fooling them enough that they try that and it just works. And well, so, it's nice to see your hand on the screen, right? I mean, it's, it's a really yeah, nice yeah. mnemonic for you just to, or a visual mnemonic for you just to have yeah. it and you can see, oh, okay, hands open, just like my own hand. Yep. Yeah. So, I, so that's exciting to me. Like, I think, you know, if, if we can get the sheer complexity of the input that people can casually provide to us uh, with track controllers is really exciting stuff. Yeah. Well, I know the VR community thanks you for that. Uh, it's, it's pretty fantastic. And, and you mentioned, and I, I, I want to sort of shift gears a little bit because you mentioned the mod community and one of the uh, coolest parts of your story, I think, is how you got started. Like 24 years ago, right? You were, <laughs> is, that, is that right? You were, you were working yeah, on a mod and, and you joined Valve. Can you, can you talk yeah. about that? Yeah, actually. Um, it's 1996, right? 96, yeah. It's a long well, time ago. How did that happen? Did, did Valve reach out to you? Did you reach out to Valve? Uh, no, uh, actually, neither of those are technically accurate. Um, Scott Lynch, who worked, who's been at Valve for years now, was actually the head of Sierra Studios at the time. And he was, as to my understanding, instrumental in getting Sierra to even get into the action game genre in the first place by signing up Half-Life 1. And I think he was looking around at other ways that he could, uh, you know, that they could make Half-Life as good as it could be. And so he reached out to us. So that this was more in, you know, 98. So 96 is when Ian Corley and John Cook and I uh, released the first version of TF. And so it goes for a couple of years and sort of got fairly popular there. And so I think that, I assume that's sort of why Scott contacted us. And so I think that was, you know, at the time we'd, we'd started thinking about what we were doing next. Um, you know, we... We had no idea how screwed we were, I think, in retrospect. <laughs> yeah, I mean, at that point, like, if we wanted to make anything, we would have had to figure out how to put it in a retail box. Good good luck doing that. Um, uh, we just had no idea. Uh, yeah, so uh, people had been sort of 
talking to us a little bit about doing some contract design work. I think we did some stuff with Activision and others and then, uh, but it was very sort of remote and distance and slow. And then Scott was very quick. Uh, he sort of contacted us and he said, we're interested. And he said, great, here's plane tickets. We'll see you in a couple of days. And so uh, we flew over and met with Valve uh, at the time and started working uh, pretty quickly. Thought it was really neat. At that point, Half-Life hadn't shown a lot. There wasn't a lot public. Um, mm-hmm. But uh, we saw what they'd built and thought it was awesome and started said, yeah, we could make a Team Fortress. I think we showed them what we had at the time. <laughs> it was TF2. Um, yeah. uh, and that, you know, worked for a couple of months just on a contract basis at Valve before they said, you know what, uh, I think if I remember rightly, they said, we've been looking at your code. Uh, you know, we'd like to make you an offer. And we were like, wait, you've looked at our code and you still want to make an offer? That sounds great. <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so. Well, 24 years at a company is is unusual in any industry. Uh, and I, I, I've i heard sort of from the outside about how cool Valve's culture is. And I, I would love to just hear your perspective. What is what is Valve's culture like? Uh, gee, that's a hard... I, I'm sure it, this is an interesting one because whatever answer you'll get, I'm sure there'll be people at Valve who will disagree with me. Um, <laughs> and I'm sure the people who've left Valve will disagree with me because, you know, Valve's like, I'm sure my perspective of Valve's culture is very different than the perspective of someone who's been at Valve for 10 years or one year. Um, I don't know, like Valve for me was a place, you know, I showed up to Valve when I was 22 or so. Um, I'd never met a group of people as smart as the set of people who were there. Um, I, I'd never... I'd met sort of a person here or there who might have been as smart as as some of those people, but I'd never met a, such a concentrated group of people like that. I, like I met people there who were smart in ways I'd never realized that people could be like that. And I guess I just I I remember just learning so much and just such a continual basis that um, that was that sort of became my obsession. Uh, you know, just I wanted to work with them and I wanted to learn as much as I could from them. And so I would go, I remember just year after year feeling like, man, I was an idiot a year ago uh, and just feeling that continuously um, just because I kept meeting these people, you know, working with these people. I worked, you know, I worked on game design and code side with people for a while. And then I, I did, went and did some some sort of marketing PR stuff with people and they were incredibly good and worked, did product stuff and, you know, just anywhere, whatever I worked on, the people who I was with were all just so much smarter than me and just, it was, it was, it was incredibly inspiring, you know, sort of short answer. Um, and like, I still, that's still a big part of what I like about Valve, I guess, is I still feel like I'm surrounded by people who are all really good at what they do and I get to learn from them a bunch. Um, uh, the other big thing, I guess, Valve w- was uh, experiencing that um, sort of firsthand what happens when other people take your ideas or your thoughts or things you created uh, to places that you couldn't have imagined in, you know, you just had no capability of imagining, um, right? Like, like Team Fortress is a good example. Like when I look at Team Fortress 2, there are so many things in that that, you know, like, you know, like it obvious, like it's, it's a visual style, like that, that's just, if you'd asked, you know, John, Ian and I, what we would have liked Team Fortress to look like if we had, you know, if we could wave a magic wand and it could just magically look exactly, we couldn't have imagined anything that cool. Um, hmm. You know, so it it was, that's sort of the other big thing, I guess, I, I feel like I've gotten used to, or I came to love about Valve was just getting to work with a bunch of people who would, were so good at what they did that you, they would come back with something and you just, you would, I just feel constantly just amazed that they, that it could, that that could even exist. And so that's super exciting. Like, I, you know, recent example of that would be, for example, um, Alex's sound work. I think Alex, the, the sound and audio on Alex is just, just shocking to me and her, sort of how, how much it adds to the experience and how, how incredible that, that work is. Uh, I agree with that. And I, I also, I just give Valve in general, a lot of credit for, 
for just their creative approach to sound. I mean, I remember back on Half-Life 1 and especially on Half-Life 2, some of the signature sounds in that game were just so unique. And in fact, we at Insomniac refer to Half-Life 2, or at least I do, pretty frequently because it's one of the best examples of a, a death sound in any game ever, right? <laughs> that flatline sound that the, the combine, combine makes when you yeah. shoot them, man, it is such a perfect sound because it is... It's very clear. It cuts through everything else. It's it's it makes sense, right? Uh, even though you never in real life hear that kind of sound, but it totally clues yeah. you into what just happened. And we, because one of the challenges we have in our games is how do you determine that an enemy is really dead, right? Yeah. How do you know? And yeah. and that's just brilliant. Anyway, that's just one example. I mean, all of the vehicles that are chasing you in the game, the guns. I'm I'm again fanboying out here, but I think Valve has made some of the just most incredible signature just moments and including audio, including, uh, you know, Team Fortress 2 as well, which is a favorite of ours at Insomniac and, and everything else you guys have done. It's been really impressive. Portal just goes on. Yeah. Oh, thanks. I mean, yeah. I, don't, I, I wish I could say something super you know, useful about as to how that came about. Um, <laughs> but I mean, I think it's, I, I, I think at a high level, we've just tried to, you know, do what I think you know, we all try to do and is hire really good people. And then um, I think culturally, you know, to get back to your culture question, I think we just try to, as much as we can, put, like encourage them to get in bed within the team, you know, become a big part of the creative process. Don't sort of regard, you know, don't separate and, you know, we don't sort of separate by discipline or anything like that and uh, really focus on, um accepting creative input from everyone all the time, no matter where it's coming from. Um, you know, when, yeah. and so I think that some of our biggest successes really just come from those bits where we get those multiple, all the disciplines involved um, from the get go. Right. So, um, I mean, to pick a spot, I think that really embodies this in Alex, it'd be Jeff. Um, if you've played through the Jeff sections, um, the internally, we call him the blind zombie because he starts, you know, he starts, uh, you know, he's actually one of the longest pieces of content in the product. Like we started him very early on and it took the longest time to get right. Uh, hmm. And so it starts because we were doing observations about what, what, what is an interesting thing to do in VR that was sort of, that's novel that, you know, really wasn't something that was interesting to do in non VR in a way. Um, and so this is early on, uh, you know, we're probably three or four months into the project at this point. So we're watching a lot of people play this early prototype we've got that's sort of 15 minutes or so of, of Half-Life 2 content, like literally all Half-Life 2's assets, textures and, and AI and everything just running in VR. We've got rudimentary hands going. Hmm. And um, we're just, you know, we're putting people through and we're just trying to look for, for patterns. Like what are the things that people are saying that, you know, that multiple people say, uh, what what are the what are reactions that multiple people are having and so on? And one of the things we noticed was that a bunch of people would enjoy getting up close to um, Half Life Two enemies. Like so, we we had dev maps where all the enemies are standing around, right? So you could move around them and stuff like that. And people would like to they'd walk around like a Half Life Two enemy, like some model that they'd seen a thousand you know for a thousand times in Half Life Two, and talk about how interesting it was to see it up close. In you know. You know They'd often talk about how like it looks different than they thought or whatever, and they liked looking at the level, the detail. They'd notice things on the character that they hadn't noticed, even though they'd seen that character so much in Half Life Two. And so that sort of we, we took from that the sort of abstract idea that being close to enemies was an interesting thing in VR in a way that it really hadn't been that interesting in the past in non VR. And so we started asking ourselves, well, what? what could be an enemy that we could design that would be literal? That was the core sort of excuse of it. It was, a, and it, it got very close to you, but it didn't kill you. Um, hmm. And so we messed around for a bit. And out of that came this idea of, well, what if we've got a, a zombie of some kind? I mean, it, it, it wasn't really, it was running zombie AI, so it didn't really matter. In the end, it runs no zombie AI, um, <laughs> but we just used a zombie model at the time. So we said, what if we have a blind enemy and you have to, and we, construct the level such that you have to be very close to it a bunch of times, but it's actually, as long as you sort of 
stay quiet, um, then, you know, it, it can't kill you. And then we can structure the level such that, you know, we know it's going to get very close to you. And so it starts all the way back there and then goes for like, you know, then fast forward three and a half years of dev work or so, uh, cause God, it took so much work to get that thing to work. Um, just down to things like, you know, if you say you've got an enemy that, that, um, responds to sound, right? I mean, as I'm sure you know, in your games, you play sounds all the time uh, yeah. and of all different volumes and so on. And the trying to build a rule set around what sounds, it became pretty clear quickly that we could, he shouldn't react to all sound. He should react to some sounds and not others. And, you know, it's teaching the player the, the rules around that was took lots of iteration but the to roll back to the, the original thing that, that made me think of this is i remembered seeing for just months uh throughout for you know well over the course of the project years but for there would be concerted sort of pushes on the blind zombie for months where i would see this a room full of people watching a play test and then debating for you know two three hours often after a single play test um what they'd seen and that group would, you know, contained, um, you know, all these various dis disciplines. So you've got the animator for the blind zombie in there. You've got the model for the blind zombie in there. You've got the level designer, the programmers, and the sound guys, uh, and often the writers would be in there too. And so you have this whole discipline. And so you've got in particular, I think for someone like Jeff, because sound was such a big deal for that design, the sound engineers or designers were in that, those original conversations and those original play tests and they were in and watched every one of those play tests all the way through to when the game shipped as well. And so if, if there's anything that I could point to and say, I think this is why sound has worked out well in our games, it'd be trying to embed those people that early and that deeply into the process so that they're there talking about, I think we should change the visual design to this, or we should change this bit of the level, you know, so that, it, it sound is being treated really importantly in that that core design of the of the you know sort of the gameplay element you're dealing with. I agree. I mean, that's a, that's an important discussion for I think all dev teams to have is that audio is a first class citizen, and it's it's so interesting to me how over the years you know we've evolved visuals. It's we started out being a very visual industry, uh, and then audio has caught up, and and in many ways uh, without without the kind of audio we have today, you know, games wouldn't be successful. It just, it just wouldn't. And, but yeah. they're the, in many ways, the silent partner to not silent. Sorry. That's, yeah. that's ironic. Pretty good. Um, <laughs> yeah. But they're, the, they're the sort of the unseen, but super important team that's in there. And we also have the same approach. You got to get the audio designers in at the beginning because they, they offer so much and they, they really need to be there to, to help vet the ideas and, and make them better. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I th yeah, I think this was also the first project where we really got that first class citizen sort of stuff in at the code and systems levels too. So the, the level of control and power the sound team had over, um, you know, over all their systems, uh, over their sounds and everything was sort of much more at the level that we managed to, I think, get into a smaller set of things in Half-Life 2, right? There were sort of subsystems in Half-Life 2 where, um, you know, like particles or or something like that had a huge. Actually, I guess not in Half Life Two. Particle systems were Half Life Two particle systems were not that great <laughs> compared to what we got to later. But uh, you know, we like in Half Life Two we started thinking a lot about how we sort of abstractly link our content together um, so that various disciplines could iterate as rapidly as they wanted to and could be as additive and creative as they want to without requiring anyone any other discipline to sort of create a hook for them or to get involved. Um, and I think Alex was really the first time we fully achieved that on sound. So, you know, they have some real powerful capabilities around all their sounds, whether it's wanting to look at the state of the world. Like if I want to make, I want to feed in the distance between the enemy, you know, the number of zombies that are, that have got a uh, line of sight to the player and the distance between them and the player um, and maybe the time since they last attacked or whatever. If I want to feed any of those sorts of bits of information into my sound uh, and then feed it into, you know, the volume or the attenuation or whatever other part of the sound I want, they, they, they sort of created that capability. They, they, they really have a, essentially a mini programming language. They can bolt code onto any 
uh, any sound that's playing and, and manipulate it dynamically. And they, they got a huge amount of uh, power out of that that really manifested, that I think, allowed them to take those game design sort of goals and really uh, make sound work for game, you know, do heavy lifting on the game design side in a way that we haven't really been able to in the past so much beyond just like, hey, when this happens, the sound should play type stuff. Yep. To me, it's been wonderful to hear more about Valve's culture and the games you've been making. But I also want to just congratulate you on Alex, you and the team. It's It really is an incredible experience. And for our listeners who haven't tried it out, you you need to. It is, it's a great example of how VR can realize the promise of VR. I, I think the Valve team has done an amazing job of bringing that world to life in a way that I, as a fan, have, have wanted to see it. So, uh, Robin, if people have additional questions for you, how can they get in touch with you? Uh, actually, I think on the on the Valve software webpage, there's a contact form, and you can mail Valve various Valve employees who have been silly enough to say, "Sure, I'll accept emails from <laughs> random people on the line." Um, luckily, I'm one of those people, so yeah, feel free to to uh, just go and send me an email. That's really cool, by the way, that Valve does that. <laughs> um, well, I, I hope people take advantage of that and ask you reasonable questions and, and insightful questions. So uh, again, thank you, Robin, for taking the time to join us today. Uh, thank you very much. It was great. Thank you for joining us for the Game Maker's Notebook. For more information on the Academy of Interactive Arts and Sciences, our podcasts, and our other initiatives, please visit www.interactive.org.